Funding for NJ Business Beat with Raven Santana provided by NJMEP, a partner to New Jersey's manufacturing industry, focused on productivity, performance, and strategic development. More on NJMEP.org. And by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, announcing its Renew Jersey Business Summit and Expo, March 26th and 27th at Harris in Atlantic City. Event details online at njchamber.com. This is NJ Business Beat with Raven Santana. Hello, I'm Raven Santana. Thanks for joining me on NJ Business Beat. March is Women's History Month, and we just marked International Women's Day last week. So we're taking the pulse of the women-owned business community, which is among the fastest-growing business sectors in the country. According to a recent U.S. Senate committee report, there are more than 14 million women-owned businesses in the country. That's 40% of all businesses in the U.S. Women accounted for about 50% of all new businesses for the third year in a row, and they make $2.7 trillion in annual revenue. And the rate of growth is even higher for black women-owned businesses. Almost 15% of current businesses are owned by black women. They earn $98 billion in revenue annually and employ close to 530,000 workers. Here in New Jersey, there are more than 320,000 women-owned businesses. That's about 40% of the companies in the state. And women make up almost half of all employees in the Garden State. To learn the progress women have made in businesses in New Jersey and the challenges that remain, I spoke with Rena Shanawani, Executive Director of the Women's Center for Entrepreneurs. Rana, what is the Women's Center for Entrepreneurship and what does it mean to be a resource partner for the Small Business Administration? The WCEC Women's Business Center is an SBA resource partner. We are one of over 150 other women's business centers across the country and all receive the same grant from Congress that goes through the SBA. And I like to think of us as the SBA's field officers. So we're out in the community, connecting with clients, connecting with entrepreneurs. We prioritize women. However, anyone is welcome to come and use our resources. And we provide business training, counseling, webinars, anything that you can think of on any topic in regards to business. We have subject matter experts plus the staff. All of us can assist to help them grow their business. You know, what are the types of programs and resources? You named a few, but let's elaborate a little more. Uh, the WCC offers aspiring entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs with existing businesses as well. If you are at the concept level and you would like to launch your business, register your business, you're not sure what legal entity you would like to register it as because there are many options, we can help you, we can connect you as well with legal experts, all at either no cost or low cost. So we are trying to help the entire community. We do not put barriers based on any kind of price. So anyone can come and we can assist them. In addition to that, we can help you with fi any type of financial literacy. The biggest thing that we get requests for are both access to capital and the mm -hmm. second is marketing. So most of our clients have a business or they are struggling to start a business and they then want to grow and improve the concept. So they want to market. And right now that's very complicated. Mm -hmm. It used to be in the past that it was simple. There were only a few vehicles where you could advertise, but now it's so complicated and people need a lot of assistance. What yeah. type of e-sales would they like to do? Which platform is the best match for them? How do they manage that? How do they get content, publish? Where do they target their, all of their sales and their marketing to? So we help them with everything. When we talk about diversity and we talk about including everyone and really giving them those resources opportunities, what I also liked is that, is that also means with reentry. The WCEC also believes in empowering women leaving the prison system through entrepreneurial education. So tell us more about that. I really like that. I think it's worth kind of touching on that as well. We are so excited about a grant we received that we applied for from the Department of Corrections. 
to help women who are in prison and who are going to be released from prison soon. So we started this past month. We have a nine-week program where we go in. We have a curriculum, start and grow a business. And then we hope to continue with the ladies when they get released. So to continue with them. And we're excited about this particular grant because normally we teach and then we continue to coach and assist while the client executes everything on their own and implements everything on their own. With this grant, we actually have some extra resources to hire people for them. So normally, for example, let's say you want to start a business and part of that requires you to launch a website. That's where you get all those e-sale conversions. We would teach you how to do that and normally the client goes and does it on their own. And it's tough and they don't, a lot of times they struggle and they might not have the bandwidth of the time. But in this case, we'll actually, in addition to teaching them, we'll say, hey, well, if you would like to hire a freelancer, we have a small budget to help you hire that freelancer and launch that with you. So it's going to be a lot of extra support to get them through and help them build up through that e-commerce phase. Yeah, I really, I really do love that. Rena, why certify as a woman-owned business? And what is the process for certification? Certification is a great tool, especially if you're trying to land those government contracts. And sometimes as well, there are also corporations that will set aside specific contracts just for people who are certified. So there are different types of certifications. One of them is for women-owned certifications. And it's for those set aside. So let's say, for example, they have contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars that are going out to vendors. And they'll set aside for that 5%. Usually the government will set aside 5% that must go specifically for women who have been certified. Mm. And so those certifications can be tricky and complicated. They sometimes women do or our clients in general need a little bit of technical support to get those certifications. We help walk them through that at, to a certain phase, and then we also hand them over to a lot of our collaborating nonprofit entities. So there are actually centers, again, supported by the government with, that receives some funding mm -hmm. and helps them. They have full-time employees, both also nonprofits, so very low cost and no cost, and they will stick with them through the end and help them compile that paperwork and submit and get those certifications. Rena, I'm wondering, you know, what are businesses where women are finding the most success? Oh, that's a very good question. I, we have such a huge variety of different businesses that we support. So on, on one end, you have a lot of solopreneurs, women who are working on their own inside their homes where they are creating products let's say beauty products, some, now that we have passed the cottage food law in New Jersey, a lot of people are baking from their homes. In the past, they used to have to go to commercial kitchens. Mm. That's one. And the, on the, we also have tech businesses and offshore wind businesses that we're starting to support now, especially that this is becoming a booming industry in New Jersey. We have people who are in the service industry. So you have professionals who are accountants and lawyers and everything in between. So we have a, a very large spectrum and we can help. We've, I think we've helped so many, we've helped over a thousand women per wow. year. It's just a reminder why, why it's always a good idea to invest in women. Rena, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, anytime. We wanted to hear about the hard work needed as a woman business owner straight from someone who is living the life right now. Janaba Johnson-Jones is the founder and CEO of Hudson Kitchen, an organization that helps promising entrepreneurs start a food business through training courses and other support. Her business has created 58 jobs and has generated $9 million in revenue. I spoke to Johnson Jones about why she created Hudson Kitchen and how she's helping other women get their businesses off the ground. So what I love most about your story is all of this wasn't the original vision. You actually lost your job and then this came about. Talk about the journey to how we got here, Janaba. Sure, sure. So I actually wanted to start a completely different business. I wanted to start a fitness concierge service where wow. I help people figure out where to work out and what Entirely to do. Entirely different. Completely different. <laughs> you're right, you're right, Got right. a personal trainer certification and I'm talking to my friend wow. today and she says, 
what do I eat? You're gonna tell me what to, how to work out, what do I eat? And I was like, oh, so I found a chef. We started creating recipes. We're gonna launch this meal prep business and we couldn't find a kitchen. And so that started the journey to Hudson Kitchen. So tell me a little bit about what it takes to open up a business like, uh, like this, Hudson Kitchen. <laughs> I mean, when we think about funds and loans and grants, what does that look like? I started doing it with a competitive analysis. I'm like, what is out there? So at the time, which was about nine years ago, there were six commercial kitchens that were open 24 seven in the state of New Jersey. Yeah, so um, after the competitive analysis, I actually started looking for a location, just thinking it would be so easy. I was so naive, mm -hmm. and so I was very challenged in that. So I looked at so many different places. And what I ended up doing was starting to do networking events and creating community around the concept of Hudson Kitchen and what I was going to do, which was the best thing I could have ever done. Because when it was time for me to go get financing, I was able to give 50 letters of interest to a bank. So it was fantastic. So that networking kind of Putting yourself out there yes. is what really helped. Talk, can we kind of elaborate on what grants and loans in that process looks like? Because it doesn't seem easy. Absolutely, so I did several things. So the first thing I did was I took the Community Business Academy course with the Rising Tide Capital. It's a 12 week program, helps you kind of walks you through creating a business plan. I'd already created my plan at that time, but just to sit with other entrepreneurs and some instruction for a couple of weeks in community with them to kind of hone the plan was really important. And then the next thing I did was I took another course with Union County Economic Development, UCECD. And they did a course kind of um, just kind of focusing on grow, what, what does it look like to kind of grow, kind of grow the business. And so from there, I developed a relationship with them mm -hmm. in conjunction with Hudson County Economic Development Corporation. And they took my business plan to the banks for me. We put uh, some of our own money in. And then also I re we received a um, SBA loan from, with Provident Bank. So they, were, they have been an amazing partner um, in this business and helping us kind of get it up and running. And in addition to that, I also applied for grants. There's a lot of free money, for lack of a better term, out there for businesses. Right. I've gotten over $200,000 in, in grant money wow. for Hudson Kitchen. Wow. Yeah. Do you think that's part of the issue? People, women, don't know that there is, women, there is all this money out there that's available? I completely agree. There's so many resources, especially here in the state of New Jersey. It's just about finding them and taking advantage. Let's talk about Hudson Kitchen. What is it? Because it's so <laughs> many things and you're helping so many people. So let's describe what it is that people do here. Sure, so we're a food business incubator. So when I started the business, I mentioned that I do, did networking events, but I also launched a course called the Food Business Boot Camp to teach people what oh, to cool. do. Because when I was doing my research, I was like, how do I actually start a food business? Right, right, right. And I took everything that I learned and wrote this course, the Food Business Boot Camp, and then I got experts to help me teach on the things that they were, the, the, they, they were an expert at. So it was really great. So I understand you opened, you start in 2019. So the, the, this kitchen opened in 2019, but mm -hmm. the business actually started in 2015. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we opened here, um, it took about nine months of construction. Um, we're here on this beautiful campus at Kearney Point. Um, they're an you know, amazing kind of group of people to work with. They're really all about innovation and supporting small business. And so um, I, this is my first construction project ever. We have an 8,000 square foot facility. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, designed by me. Which <laughs> you keep wowing me. I mean, it's one thing after another. Um, the space is beautiful, and I feel like um, it's really intentional as I walk through. And people are going to be able to see it as we give them a preview of this. But I think what is also important is the location and the people who are utilizing it. Right. So tell me who's here and kind of how you're like actually helping them to expand and grow in their own right. Sure, so we are a collaborative space. As you can see here, um, it is one large kitchen where multiple businesses work together. So we work with consumer packaged goods companies, wow. catering companies, meal prep companies, and we also have food trucks that are parked outside. I saw one yeah. parked outside. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about um, some of, are there, you know, are there any familiar names or who starts here? Is it those who are just starting up their business? Is it those who just need a space and are who already established? So we have a little bit of both. We have some people that have like day one starting their business, okay. but the majority of the people that work here have some demonstrated sales. And so they have some traction in the business before okay. they come to a space like ours. And yeah. why is this beneficial 
to them. So you get the, the benefit of the community. So for example, we have some people that um, have a part, the people that have part-time jobs here. They work for part-time for one company okay. and part-time for another. They also get to share resources. So I know even when, and I share resources with me as well. So packaging and um, everything and, and ingredients, like they can share all that information together you know, with each other to help each other grow. And Janaba, is this, when they come, do they, like, what do, what do they have to bring? I see there's a lot of stuff here, right? So I, I see a lot of, like, cooking equipment. I, there's people in the background cooking right now. <laughs> so what happens when you come? How does someone use this space? Sure. So, um, we, so we provide the basics. So as okay. you can see, obviously, there's sinks and, and ovens and tables and things like that. And all of our members bring in their own equipment. So any pots and pans and spoons and that type of thing comes from the member themselves, okay. as well as their ingredients. We really feel like we're a home for their business. So you don't have to, when you're here, there's, a lot, there's plenty of storage. You don't have to take anything back and forth. You can receive your ingredients here, make your food here and deliver it out the door. You spoke a lot about community. Yeah. And obviously that's very personal to you. It's important to you. Mm. Talk about what that has done for your business. It's been, it is the foundation of my business. Mm. I would not have this business if it wasn't for the community. If it wasn't for creating community around a concept. I mean, I, I was selling people my dream and um, in, in bringing them together. And it's been the wildest ride and the best ride. Yeah. Uh, for people who are watching, who may have dreams or aspirations, may be stuck, may be scared to pivot. Mm -hmm. I mean, this seems probably to them galaxies away. What would you tell them? To just get started put one foot in front of the other. It is, it is nerve wracking, it's challenging. There's some days when you just don't wanna move forward and you've gotta just go ahead and make that phone call, send that email, talk to that person, go to that networking event and kind of and move your idea forward. This growth just speaks to kind of the sky's the limit yeah. really, especially for women. It's yes. always smart to invest in women. It's true, <laughs> it's very true. Janaba, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Many women can trace some of their success back to the skills they learned and the people they met when participating in Girl Scouts. Natasha Hemmings is the CEO of Girl Scouts Heart of New Jersey, and she's the first black woman to hold the role. I sat down with Hemmings to discuss her historic position and how the Girl Scouts help prepare young girls for promising careers. All right, Natasha, now, when I was a Girl Scout growing up, it was such an incredible experience, and it is so nice to see my daughter now be a first-year Daisy. And most people, when we think about entrepreneurship, we tend to forget that it starts at a young age. So let's start with that. So let's start with that. Um, <laughs> So many of our serial entrepreneurs, CEOs, women who have taken over boardrooms and are leading companies um, have experienced their first entrepreneurial um, learnings as Girl Scouts. They were selling Girl Scout cookies and they credit it to their own success. Um, the Girl Scout cookie program is the largest entrepreneurial program for girls, not just in America, but around the world. Wow. It's an incredible experience. I'm sure you know because your <laughs> daughter, um, your Girl Scout, is teaching you about the That's five right. basic skills. Currently, I have like, I think, 15 boxes at home I'm trying to sort out, right? It's for that not in, enough. In, <laughs> for that in person <laughs> delivery. But I want to kind of um, talk about not just the selling aspect. There are lifelong entrepreneurial skills being taught as well. Can we elaborate on those skills and opportunities yeah. being offered through the Girl Scouts? Girls earn and learn through the Girl Scout Cookie Program. It helps fund their activities. And while they're learning those five basic skills, it's going to help them in business and in their life. Everything the Girl Scouts does, everything is designed to help them grow and deliver on the mission, which is building girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. They are an important ingredient in the Girl Scout leadership experience and everything from goal setting, decision making, money management, people skills, and even business ethics are all a part of the Girl Scout cookie program. Um, I'm sure that your daughter has talked to you about the goals that she set yeah. with her, her troop mates. Um, and when Girl Scouts set goals 
and they work with their team, their troop, their leaders. They create a plan and most of them reach them. It matters to girls, goal setting does, um, because they need to know how to set goals and how to reach goals in school, on the That's job, right. and in life. When we think about the Girl Scouts, I really want to focus on, you know, diversity. You are the mm -hmm. first African-American female chief executive officer of the Girl Scouts heart of New Jersey. We know if you see it, then you can be it. And it really is a safe space for girls to really foster so many different skills. So talk about when we think about diversity and we think about those types of skills and confidence that is mm -hmm. also being taught within the Girl Scouts. Absolutely. Um, Girl Scouts gives girls access to life-changing experiences, and that access inspires them to do big things. I wasn't a Girl Scout growing up as a child. I'm from Plainfield, right? And so Plainfield, New Jersey, Girl Scouts didn't find me, and I didn't find them. Mm -hmm. So seeing myself as a CEO was quite um, unbelievable and out of the realm of possibilities until I was mentored by Michelle Tuck Ponder. She is the first African-American CEO in Girl Scouting here in the state of New Jersey down at Delaware Raritan. And seeing her rise to CEO and then teach me mm -hmm. all of the lessons that I needed to learn to be prepared for this seat that I stepped into in 2018 was huge. Having a mentor, having a role model to do something that I didn't even know I wanted to do at the time. But I spent 18 years talking about Girl Scouting, um, sharing girls' stories, uh, talking about how they were changing the world and how their ideas were, in fact, improving their communities. Okay. And those girls came from all cultural backgrounds. It's an incredible opportunity that I hope that girls from different cultures, ethnicities, different communities get a chance to try for themselves. You know, and the Girl Scouts took on Trenton last year on International Day of the Girl, where they met with First Lady Tammy Murphy and state leaders, earning a democracy badge. I love that. Tell me more about that. That's another example of what you're teaching girls as well. It is another example, teaching girls about civic engagement and right. governance um, and them being the voice for their communities is all a part of Girl Scouting. Um, we did go down to Trenton. We took about 45 girls on a wow. bus from northern New Jersey all the way down to Trenton. We met with legislators. We met with First Lady Tammy Murphy and other women in government and leadership in the different agencies. And they told us about how to make a law how a bill becomes a law, how a community effort can turn into lawmaking in the state of New Jersey. It was an incredible opportunity. And girls talked about how their ideas end up coming to, in front of legislators and get passed here in the state. Right. I mean, we might have future lawmakers right there in that group. That's what's so incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. We also had the, found out that many of the women who were speaking on the panel to our Girl Scouts were Girl Scouts oh. themselves from other parts of the state and other parts of the country. So seeing the girls seeing themselves in these women was an incredible opportunity. Natasha, thank you for inspiring and teaching so many girls including my own, in turn women, right? <laughs> to leave, you know, the place better than you found it. You know, I mean, it's Absolutely. truly the it's truly the Girl Scout way. Yeah, it definitely is. It's a wonderful opportunity. I hope that girls around this state take advantage of the Girl Scout leadership experience and get involved. We need more volunteers That's so right. that we can serve more girls. That's right. Natasha, thank you so much for joining me on NJ Business Beat. Thank you. Before we leave you, here's a look at the top business headlines of the week. New Jersey's public accountants are giving failing grades to the governor's budget proposal. In a survey released this week by the New Jersey Society of CPAs, nearly 80% of those surveyed believe the budget would make the state's economy significantly worse or marginally worse over the long term. And when it comes to the controversial corporate transit fee, close to 80% of the CPAs surveyed opposed it, saying it would drive business out of the state and prevent new ones from opening up here. This week, a state-appointed monitor released a fiscal accountability plan for NJCU, but said the school has made great strides to end its ongoing financial crisis. 
Henry Amoroso's report states NJCU struggles stem from decreasing enrollment, bad real estate investments, and financial mismanagement. Amoroso credits current interim president Andreas Acebo with turning things around through high school recruitment, community college agreements, and more. One of Amoroso's more controversial recommendations was to merge programs with other schools, something current faculty says would be a detriment to students. We owe to the students past, present, and still to come to explore the opportunities that may combine a sufficient synergy. Thinking about a merger, I think would be the kiss of death in terms of the identity of this institution. The average uh, family salary uh, income for stu students that attend NJCU is like $42,000 a year, impoverished. So the school um, has been a beacon of hope. Well, that does it for us this week. Remember to subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. I'm Raven Santana. Next week, we take a very early look at the economic impact of the 2026 World Cup, as well as how the state's business community is preparing to host the international event. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next weekend. Funding for NJ Business Beat with Raven Santana provided by NJMEP, a partner to New Jersey's manufacturing industry, focused on productivity, performance, and strategic development. More on NJMEP.org. And by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, announcing its Renew Jersey Business Summit and Expo, March 26th and 27th at Harris in Atlantic City. Event details online at NJChamber.com.